So I was at this state when I took it to ShmooCon 2010. Uh, who was there? Woo! Who couldn't get there because of the snow? Uh, the second group of you, you're key sheeters. <laughs> um, so the, we were trapped in the hotel. The entire city of DC was shut down. And you know, I start pulling out the IM me and I, I made a tr carrier wave transmitter to be able to broadcast Morse code. And I started broadcasting Morse code right in the middle of the AT&T GSM spectrum. <laughs> uh, so I yelled out, who has a USRP? And neighbor drops along. And he sets that up as a spectrum analyzer. And we're able to tune it and map out some of the tunings. Um, by doing this, we're able to tell exactly where the radio is transmitting as opposed to where it's supposed to be transmitting. And we could see the drift, and we started playing around with the radio, and Mike suggested that perhaps he should grab a few of these and start playing with them on his own. Um, so with that, we're going to play one more video from the original manufacturers, and then Mike's going to take over for a couple of slides. Hi, I'm Brooke. Congratulations on getting your new I am me. Now you don't have to be glued to your computer anymore to I am your family and friends from anywhere in your house. Let me help you get started. <laughs> Uh, at the end, I want everyone to join in in singing the theme song. Because, <laughs> so cool. you know, it's so cool and it's so connected. So connected. Like, everyone sing along, okay? Come on. <laughs> Come on. So cool. cool. So, so connected. connected. Hi, I'm Brooke. Congratulations. All right. There you go. All right, thank you, Brooke. And Travis. Brooke did all the real work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's a real man. So, yeah, I decided I had to get myself, get myself some of these. And, uh, of course, you know, key sheeters, before they buy stuff, they sometimes read consumer reports. Real men, before they buy stuff, read FCC test reports. <laughs> and uh, this is a photo, uh, actually, from the FCC filing for the IM me. Uh, and as in many photos in such filings, you can, you can just about make out the uh, name of the chip right there. Uh, there, are, there are photos of both sides of all the circuit boards. Uh, there's a test report that tells you things about what frequencies it's supposed to operate on. It tells you, uh, it gives you information about uh, uh, often, not always, but often about the modulation that's used and the, and the, the uh, bit rate and all kinds of things. Um, and it's chock full of all of these uh, uh, out, uh, output figures from spectrum analyzers that show uh, detailed uh, documentation about the emissions the thing makes, which can give you a lot of clues, even if it doesn't say, well, this thing operates at 270 kilobits per second. You might be able to figure that out just by analyzing the figures in there. And it also uh, shows you stuff about unintentional emissions. So if you're one of these people who likes to uh, look into unintentional emissions of particular products. Like there was some interesting work done uh, a year or two ago on um, unintentional emissions from wired keyboards and picking those up from several meters away and like through walls and stuff. Uh, one thing they didn't do was test uh, wireless keyboards that might have similar vulnerabilities. Now there's the obvious vulnerability in wireless keyboards, right? They're intentionally emitting. But Every wireless product has an FCC test report on file you can look in and see somebody else who's already documented all the places that are unintentional emissions, and that gives you a great place to start from. So it's always a good thing to go checking out those. But what do you do here? Just hit left, right. Hey, there we go. Um, so uh, the IME, the, or the CC1110 that's in the IME, uh, has three bands, that it, frequency bands that it operates on. And so this is what I was more interested in and after Dave and Travis did a lot of the hard work on reverse engineering, uh, you know, how to talk to the device, how to talk to the LCD, and so forth. I was really interested in the radio and what we could do with the radio. And these orange blocks, two of which aren't supposed to be 
touching, but they kind of are, um, represent the, the three different bands that the IME can be tuned to. And there's all kinds of interesting stuff uh, operating in these bands. In particular, uh, you know, pagers, cell phones, uh, remote keyless entry systems for automobiles and garages and so forth, uh, and multiple ISM bands, the, the uh, unlicensed bands that are used by all sorts of commercial products, including the IME. Uh, and uh, so when, once we have control of the chip in the toy, we can build our own uh, implementation that can use a much more powerful radio than is, you know, in the IME, it only uses a couple of different frequencies, but we have this radio at our disposal that can do a whole lot more. Um, the IME, as, uh, or the CC1110, as Travis mentioned, is not a software radio, uh, and I'm really into software radio, but, uh, but you can't find a software radio platform for 20 bucks. You can find one of these for 20 bucks. Uh, even though it isn't a software radio architecture, it is really flexible. And uh, you, can, uh, you can implement uh, data, transmit and receive using a whole bunch of different modulations that are implemented in silicon uh, in the, uh, as, as various modulators that you can p choose from by configuring the CC1110. Uh, and these include uh, two-level frequency shift keying, four-level frequency shift keying, which, was, uh, which is undocumented, uh, but w was sort of recently revealed uh, about a related chip, and it happens to work on this one. Uh, uh, Gaussian frequency shift keying, minimum shift keying, those four are all types of, of frequency modulation, um, where the, the frequency of the radio wave it varies and data is carried in that frequency. And then on the right we have uh, amplitude shift keying and on-off keying, and I like to think of on-off keying as being a variation of amplitude uh, modulation. Those are both amplitude modulations where the amplitude of the carrier wave is modulated uh, to carry data. Now, one of the things that is sometimes unfortunate about using a low-cost wireless transceiver like this is that you uh, have kind of a rigid packet format that you can only communicate with devices uh, or with, with radio systems that have a compatible format to the packet format in this particular chip. And uh, the, the good news is that in this chip, while it does have that kind of a packet limitation, it's very flexible. The packet format consists of a preamble, which is just 01010101, and a sync word, a synchronization word, which is uh, arbitrary uh, uh, sequence that you can program, um, an optional length field, an optional address field, uh, a data field, and an optional CRC uh, 16 field at the end. Uh, and there are also optional uh, whitening and error, uh, forward error correction and Manchester encoding that you can invoke. Uh, and the length of the preamble is programmable, the length of the sync word is programmable, the length of the data field is programmable. So you have a whole lot of options for how you construct your packets within this, within this format. And it turns out that it's compatible with tons of different devices that are out on the market. First of all, it's obviously compatible with any device that you might find that uses a CC1110 or anything in that family. Uh, but it's also compatible with tons of different low-cost radio uh, devices that use other wireless transceiver chips uh, because generally speaking, all low-cost wireless transceiver chips support some packet format that looks roughly like that. And since this one is so flexible, uh, we can use it to talk to all kinds of things. But don't forget, Mike, that it's so cool and it's so connected. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>